Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome all our visitors. I'd like to welcome everybody here, especially our internet audience. Thank you and welcome. As everybody knows, Pastor Mark is, uh, he's actually probably heading back from Israel as we speak. So continue to lift them up in prayer and um, uh, just ask that the Lord has done uh, tremendous work in the hearts of everybody that went over there. If you would all just please stand, we'll open in prayer. Abba, Father, Daddy, we delight in you today, Father. And I just ask, Lord, that you just have your way with us today, Father. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, Father, to receive what you have for us. I just ask, Father, that you just anoint Pastor Art, Father. Let him bring forth the words that you would have him speak. We thank you for this day. It's so humbling to know that, Father, you set aside a day to be with your people. We are honored and humbled to be able to spend this day with you, Father. I just ask, Lord, that you, um, that you are lifted up high, Father, that in our praise and worship, Father, that you are lifted up high and exalted. We thank you for this day. We honor you. In Yeshua's holy name we pray, amen. We are blessed here at El Shaddai to have two really wonderful teachers. And as you know, Mark's been gone, but um, Art has really uh, brought forth some really, really good teaching. And I, I don't think anybody knows the amount of time and effort that goes into preparing for a service. And I just think he deserves a great hand for all the hard work he's done. This is a, a very exciting uh, Torah portion. Uh, of course, anything about the patriarchs is exciting. This one is exciting because the half Torah portion, which I'm going to discuss as well, deals with uh, King David, uh, which is a regular drama, but it ties in actually with this Torah portion. But this one is Kaye Sarah, which is, starts in Genesis 23, 1 to 25, 18, and then 1 Kings is the half Torah from 1 to 131. And this Torah portion starts out a little bit uh, uh, different, no matter how you read it in the Hebrew or if it's in the uh, English. It reads, And Sarah was a hundred and seven and twenty years old. And these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, Kiriath Arba, it means the city of four, and the speculation on that is uh, it may have referred to the four giants, which was Ahimon, Talmai, uh, Sheshai, and their father. Others say that it's the four couples uh, that are buried there, uh, which would be Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah, but also they say that Adam and Eve are buried in the cave of Machpelah, and that's one of the stops, I believe, that Pastor Mark always takes into Hebron. How many of you have been to the cave of Machpelah? Uh, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, but uh, that's one place that you go in with an armored bus. Uh, it's a popular spot for snipers, and so you have to take an armored bus in there. In fact, we had last year David Wilder, who didn't get a chance to speak, but he's from Hebron and faces those challenges in Israel, which right now it's, pro it's 10 hours ahead. So today and last evening, they had several celebrations in Hebron around the cave of Machpelah. So it's a very important place. It's where the four spiritual giants are buried. Now, I want to show you this map here because it's important. If you could bring up that first power, there it is. She's really good. Uh, you can see where Hebron is here, and you can see where Beersheba is. Uh, and uh, Jerusalem is up in this area where Mount Moriah is, and then, of course, Bethlehem, but Hebron is down here. And uh, it says here that Abraham, he came to mourn for Sarah. And exactly what, what that is, the midrashes that talk about that, whether he was there when Sarah died or not is, is questionable uh, because uh, she was in a different place. She was, uh, she was a Kiriath Arba, which is down in that area. Uh, but they say there's, there's different midrashes, which I'm going to talk about as far as Sarah's death is concerned. But last week's Torah portion, which we didn't have the opportunity to really teach on, Viera, which was last week, dealt with the binding of Isaac, the promised seed. It's when Abraham brought, uh, was told by God to bring his only son. In fact, in Genesis 22.2, 2, 
uh, it says, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. And if you remember, those of you that were here for Danny Ben-Gigi last week, most of you were here. Did you get a kick out of Danny Ben-Gigi? You know, it's interesting. It's kind of like uh, when, when an individual like him teaches who's a professor of Hebrew, it's like a big canvas. And he takes all of these colors from all these different paints and throws them on the canvas, and you look at the picture and decide which, <laughs> which part of it you're going to learn from because he knows so many things. But he mentioned that, that Torah portion. He mentioned the Akedah, of which it's called when Abraham bought, I, brought Isaac up to Mount Moriah and, uh, and how God communicated to him, and it was that word in the Hebrew that meant God was basically saying to him, please bring your only son. It wasn't showing a picture of God as being this cruel God. Well, uh, you have the promised seed. It took you a long time for, for, to conceive, and Sarah had your son, but now go and I want to kill him. You know, it, gave, it painted a different picture when how God very, very lovingly said, please take your only son, and it was a time of proving for Abraham. And in 22.16 of Genesis, and this is on your notes, and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice." So as many of you can go back and read the account in Viera, the angel intercedes, and God says, stop. He, and that's where we get the, the name, one of the written redemptive names for God, which is Yehovah Yaira, uh, which many people, of course, teach in churches, and we sing songs about it, which is God is our provider. But it actually means the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice, and the ram comes out of the thicket, and that's what becomes the sacrifice. And it, in, in the mount of the Lord, it will be seen, and it will be seen. And that's exactly what happened uh, with Yeshua, who became uh, our offering, our sacrifice. So after the Akedah, and by the way, everything that I just said in the last 30 seconds, you can go back in the other Torah portion and read that. But in, in verse 19, <clears throat> 22, <clears throat> chapter 22, it says, Abraham... And this is after the binding of Isaac returned unto his young men. And they rose up and they went together to, to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And so that's why, uh, you know, the, the speculation as to where Sarah was and where Abraham was, that possibly Isaac and Abraham were not present when Sarah died. And Satan was unable <clears throat> to stop Abraham and Isaac in this effort. And the, as the Midrash goes about Sarah and her death is that uh, it was all during the same period of time, and, there's, and this is, again, speculation. When we say Midrash, we're really talking about stories that the Jewish people tell in explaining certain passages of Torah uh, or in discussion as to why a certain thing happened in Torah, and they say that Satan himself appeared to Sarah and said that, uh, Isaac had been slaughtered on Mount Moriah, and it was too much for her, and, and uh, she died. That was one explanation. The other one is that he came uh, and changed his appearance, and you may have heard some other ones. He changed his appearance and appeared as Isaac and said that, uh, that his father Abraham brought him to the mount and was going to slaughter him, uh, but he's, he's still alive, and that was too much for her, and she died. So those are the two stories. Uh, you may know more, and you can take either one of them with a grain of salt. But that's what they say about Sarah. But, but the thing about it in the opening verse where it says Sarah was 107 and 20 years old, uh, it says it, that she was as sinless at 100 years old as she was when she was 20 and as beautiful at 20 as she was at 7 years old. Nevertheless, Abraham loved Sarah. Isaac loved his mother. And in chapter 23, verse 3, after the death of, of Sarah, it says, Abraham stood up from before his dead, and he spoke unto the sons of Heth, saying, 
And here in this chapter, this Torah portion is called Kaye Sarah, and there's two verses that deal with, with Sarah's passing, but then there's 17 verses that deal with the acquisition of the cave of Machpelah and the negotiations that Abraham has with, uh, with Ephron to, uh, to purchase this cave because he makes it clear that he was a sojourner and he was a wanderer and he had no mean land of his own, but he wanted to purchase this cave. And there's a midrash about how he found it as well. But he was concerned about the resting place of his future generations because he believed the promise. And though the patriarchs all would eventually sleep in the cave of Machpelah, Sarah was the first one that would grace the tomb. And today, the patriarchs might be resting in peace, but their descendants are not resting in peace in Hebron because it's, it's such a uh, controversial area uh, of how it's being handled through the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and of course the, the Israeli government. Uh, and it puts Jews or any other visitors in harm's way. But it was great faith on Sarah's part to sojourn in the land and to wander in tents for all of those years. And other than the, the Lord speaking to her uh, when she was in the tent and uh, the three men, and this was in last week's Torah portion, but uh, when the Lord spoke to her in the tent about her commenting about her laughing, this is the only time there's no other reference where there's firsthand revelation to Sarah. But yet, the Lord referred to Sarah's words in reference to Ishmael and the, and the promise seed. Because in Genesis 21, 12, and this is uh, involving Hagar, it says, God said unto Abraham, this is 21, 12, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. This is talking about Hagar and Ishmael, who was not the child of the promise. This was Abraham's effort to bring forth a son, an heir to his household, according to the promise. And the Lord said, don't be grievous because of the bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, you, probably, you may be wondering, why am I spending the time that, I'm, that I am on these verses? Because you're all familiar with the story of the promise in Abraham. But the destiny of all men and the future generations of Israel and the coming of the king, our kingly Messiah, was dependent on the sustaining of this promised seed through all the generations. The direction of Sarah's life herself was dependent upon and was set by the promises that were made to Abraham. In Hebrews 11, 11, it says, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, where did Sarah hear the promises from? She heard them from Abraham. So the promise came to Abraham, she heard it, and then she believed. It's no much, it's not so much different than when the Lord speaks to us about something, or somewhere in your life, somewhere along the way, someone speaks a word to you, and you know, because we're in America, everything is instant, so you think it's going to happen tomorrow. But it may be years where you believe that word, or you believe that promise, and then God finally unfolds it at different times in your life. So patience is definitely a virtue that Abraham and Sarah both had at their age. And when we talk about the patriarchs, it's, they're, they're, they're very much that. They're our forefathers. They're the examples. Why do we study the Torah? Why do we study Genesis about the patriarchs? Because they are a picture of what we endure in our lives as well. And as we go through these Torah portions year after year, there's another quality, another virtue that you pick up from the forefathers that's part of your spiritual DNA as well. That's one thing that Danny Bengigi talked about when he was here, at least to us in private. I don't remember if he mentioned it, but the spiritual DNA that we have, that we have that part of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that's within us, as well as Yeshua. 
But what happened to the forefathers is a sign to the children. And in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 32, it says, What more, <clears throat> what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, and stopped the mouth of lions. Now, in, in the, the words that I want to focus on here is obtained promises. Now, when, you, when, you, when we read about David, when we read about Samuel or Elijah or Elisha, did they perform miracles? Elisha, did, did they perform miracles? Did things happen in their life that were supernatural? Did they receive promises? Right, Elisha performed, he got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. You know, we could go through all through the judges, we can go through the prophets and how the Lord worked things. He, he would say something to them in a promise, and it, and it would come to pass at some point. There were promises. And a promise is all of favor. It's all of grace. They heard first, and then came the promise. They believed that promise, and then they became persuaded. Just like Sarah did, she heard the promise, and then she became fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to what? Perform. That God was willing and he was able. But she had to hear it first. And then she became fully persuaded. This is a model for how we should believe on how our Heavenly Father follows through for us. There's no human merit that you can do here for obtaining a promise. In fact, the word obtain in the Greek is the word epi tukano, and it means to happen by chance. Okay? So there wasn't anything that Abraham could do except believe for him to for Sarah to conceive seed. Because he was an old timer. In Hebrews eleven seventeen it says, By faith Abraham when he was tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So here, you know, even after Abraham <clears throat> had received the promise and in obtaining the promise, even then, still in obedience, he brought forth Isaac to be offered up as a burnt offering. Even after he had received the promise. How many of you would have a bald spot on your head after scratching it so many times and saying, Why did, Lord, I thought you told me to do this? How many times that happened in your life? Well, I thought this was the direction we were going. Well, if God gave you that word, you stay with that word. In fact, that word receive, when it says he received the promises, that word is anodekomai, which means in the Greek it means to entertain as, as a guest, so, you know, receiving it as a guest. So he hadn't acquired it as of yet, but he had entertained what God had given him as the promise. Now, when you think about Abraham, <clears throat> he didn't walk around with a halo around his head. At least we didn't see it, so we didn't think there was a halo. But when God first spoke to Abram was when he was in Mesopotamia, when he was in an idolatrous area, an idolatrous country. And how do we know this? Because Stephen, when Stephen was uh, brought before the elders in Jerusalem years later, in his dissertation to the Pharisees and Sadducees in Acts chapter 7, 2, he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken, listen. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was where? In Mesopotamia. So this was the first place that God appeared or God spoke to Abraham before he dwelt in Haran. And he said unto him, Get out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. And if we bring that map up, and you've seen this map before, but he was in the Ur of the Chaldees in this area where generally where Iraq is. Uh, but it's a long way off here from Haran. So, and it's a long way off from Beersheba where Abraham crossed over, which is why he's, uh, he's, the connotation is he's a Hebrew, because a Hebrew means to cross over. It comes from the word Eber, which was a descendant of Abraham. 
So he crossed over many times over the Euphrates, and then he ended up back over in Beersheba, where, where God sp- first spoke to him was in Mesopotamia. Now, what does, that, what does that mean to us? Well, Abraham, when it talks about the promises, Abraham stands above, quite frankly, all of the Hebrews that are in Hebrews 11. And why is that? The other promises that I just read about in, in Hebrews, where they subdued kingdoms, they stopped the mouth of lions, were individual situations that people were, that these prophets or men of God were involved in. The thing about Abraham's promises is that it affected all of us in that the promise dealt with the line of the Messiah, the promised seed. So his, his faith, his believing, the promises that he received dealt with the kingly line, the, the messianic line that has all of you sitting here today. That's why he's lifted up in the book of, of Hebrews. And so the first promise came to him in the land of the Chaldeans. In Acts 7, 4, again, Stephen, it says, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, and he dwelt in Haran. Bring this, bring that map up one more time there. And Haran is up here. So he first heard from the Lord here, and then he jumped on an a express train, and he went all over. No, he didn't. It was no express trains. That was, that was his hike. That was his sojourning and his wandering. <clears throat> And concerning the land of promise, in Hebrews 11, 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, and obeyed, and he went out not even knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. The second promise came in the land of Canaan. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, or Shechem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So the Lord dealt with Abram a number of different times. Now, when we read these verses many times, we don't, we don't look at the particular, maybe we don't focus on the words, but there's two words that are, that, uh, are very strategic here. It says, both the land <clears throat> and the seed were subjects of the promises. Now, when we talk about covenants, every covenant <clears throat> might be a promise, but not every promise is a covenant. A promise only involves one party. So it's one pro- party that's promising, well, I'll promise I'll do this for you. How many of you like to make promises? <laughs> Receive promises. A covenant consists of promises between two parties. So in a covenant, this party says, well, okay, I'll, if you're going to do this, then I will do this. I'll promise that I'll do this if you promise to do that. Then it becomes a covenant. So when we look at the land of Israel today, and that's what is so unique about El Shaddai is because, you know, it's not that people, many times people come to El Shaddai and they, you know, they like to hear teaching about the Old Testament because they, they don't usually get it in other places unless they enroll in a course or whatever, but we teach Torah, we teach the Tanakh, and we, we connect it with the Brit Hadashah, which is the New Testament. But we also are very conscious of what's going on in the land of Israel today with its leaders and how it connects with prophecy and how it connects with the Torah. And so it helps us to be very tapped in prophetically to what's happening in these days. And so this land of Israel that the Jews inhabit today, and as it has always been, is not the inheritance of the Jews today because of the covenant of Torah. Just think about that for a second. Why would that be? Why would the the inheritance of the Jews today not be because of the covenant at Sinai? Well, the reason is, is because the Torah was given by God to Moses, to Israel at Sinai. And you remember what happened there is that Israel promised that they would do what God asked them to do. In fact, I think this is on your notes here. They would do as God said in Exodus 19.5. 
The Lord said, now therefore, for if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you'll be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then in verse 8, in Exodus 19, 8, then it says, and all the people answered together and said, well, then all that the Lord has spoken, we will what? We will do. So there's two sides of this covenant. The Lord is saying that, uh, he says, I'm going to make you a peculiar treasure. You're going to be a kingdom. He promises that. And then Israel comes back with their promise. All that you say, we will do. So it was a covenant. It was between two parties. And Moses returned the, the words of the people unto the Lord. Uh, Moses was the mediator. But what had happened was is that Israel breached the covenant several times, and they broke their promises to the Lord. But yet still... Even though Israel breached the covenant and they broke their promises, this didn't and doesn't even today affect Israel's rights to the inheritance of the land. Why is that? Because the inheritance of the land wasn't dependent upon the covenant, because the promise was made to Abraham some 400 years later. And so you might ask, anybody thinking about asking that? Or maybe you already know that. Why was Israel spewed from the land then at different times? Jeremiah 34, 18, it says, I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me, when they cut the calf in twain or two and passed between the parts thereof. The princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf. I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of, of them that seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. Well, there was a covenant that was made when, the, when a, a, a calf or a bull was uh, quartered out and the pieces were put on either side and then the two people would walk through the center of it, and that would be a covenant that would establish the covenant. But yet the covenant that God made with Abraham was different. Now this was also in last week's Torah portion. That's why you need to go back and read that as well. Because the promise to Abraham was di different. In Genesis 15, 8, he said, Lord God, after God had given him the promise, he said, Lord God, what, whereby shall I know? How do I know that I'm going to inherit Inherit it, inherit the land. And he, God, said to him, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took all of these, Abraham took them all, and he divided them in the midst. And he laid each piece once, one against another, but the birds he divided not. Okay, so how many of you have courted out a, you know, any of these animals that I just read here? You've ever, how many of you have done that lately? Okay, how many of you are going to cut up your turkey this next Thursday. Nobody? Okay, oh, I know that some of you ladies and your husbands are going to do that. Well, Abraham had to do these, so, I mean, he had to have help to do it. And it obviously took some time and effort to be a part of this. And he laid them all out. And, and, but look what the next thing it says. It says, then the fowls came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. And the next verse that we're going to read, it took, it took some time because... It talks about what the Lord did in the evening. He was waiting for how this covenant was going to take place. This was a normal thing. So it could have been hours and hours. Abraham had to put a lot of effort into this by driving away these fowls away from this sacrifice that, that, and this covenant that was going to take place. And Abraham was no youngster. So he had his broom. He took borrowed a broom from Sarah, and he was chasing these fowl, fowls of the air away who were trying to desecrate the pieces of this promise or this covenant. Then in verse 12, it says, When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And what had happened was, and you can read the Torah portion from last week, the Lord put Abram to sleep so that he didn't have to pass between the, the pieces. He didn't take a part in it. It was the Lord who did and this isn't on your notes, but in 15, 17, Genesis 15, 17, it says, It came to pass when the sun went down that it was dark, and behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp 
pass between those pieces. Abraham didn't pass through, but the Lord passed through, and so the promise and the covenant was made to Abraham, but it was a promise to Abraham, an unconditional one. And in verse 18 of Genesis, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. So the reception of the land is bound up with the promised seed, Yeshua as the son and as the heir of Abraham. The land and the seed are, depend- the land and the seed are dependent upon the promise of God, and the throne and the kingdom depends upon the promise as well. Now, there was a promise to Abraham, and there was also a promise to David. But how was Abraham to secure the promise to his seed? And this was mentioned by uh, Peter when he was up here and prayed, and he was exactly right. He had to choose a wife, or he had to try to secure a wife for his son Isaac, a bride for his only son. So you remember Isaac was his only begotten son, and Abram as a father to secure the seed and the promise had to supply a bride for his only begotten son. Does that sound familiar? Genesis 24.1 says, Abram was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things, and Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh, Uh, which was a sign of of taking an oath, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go into my country and my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And this was one of the stipulations, as Peter had mentioned, is that Abraham did not want Isaac to marry any of the idolaters or the people of the land of Canaan because they were so wicked. And so he solicits his, his most honorable servant in his household, Eliezer, which it doesn't mention him at first, but it is Eliezer, who then goes up to Ab- where Abraham's kindred were, takes the trip. Uh, but look what it says here in, in 24-7. It says, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your descendants will I give this land. He will send an angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And so we're not focusing on this part of the Torah portion here, but Eliezer goes up to the land. Abraham says the Lord will send an angel before you. Uh, And as the account goes with Rebekah, Rebekah comes out to draw water for Eliezer's camels, and everything lines up exactly as what Eliezer had asked and what Abraham had asked. And Rebekah then is going to come home and be the wife to Isaac. But the stipulation that, that, that was made clear by Abraham is Isaac is not to leave. You're the only begotten son, the promised seed, is not to leave the land. There's another only begotten son who didn't leave the land either, except to go up we all know who that is. Well, when his servant Eliezer returned with Rebekah, the Torah tells us where Isaac's whereabouts was. And in Genesis twenty-four sixty-two, it says, Isaac had come from Be'er Lahorai and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there were camels coming. Now, this particular area, and this was also mentioned by Peter as well, it says he went out to meditate in the field. And if you can bring up that PowerPoint for me, this was the area here and, uh, where Isaac was. It's also the place where the well is, that Hagar, when she was cast out by Sarah. That's where, uh, where Isaac was. So they were coming down from this, from this area all the way down, uh, Eliezer. And it says he went out to meditate. It shows the condition of Isaac's heart. It's the word uh, suach in the the Hebrew. It means to to muse pensively. Uh, In Psalm 102.1, it's another form of the word. It says, uh, uh, Psalm 102.1 reads a prayer of the afflicted when he's overwhelmed and pours out his complaint. That word siach, it's a form of suach, before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. 
and this is Isaac who pensively waiting to see if his bride comes back in the evening. Uh, but in Psalm 44, uh, for our soul is bowed down, suach, to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. And this, this word is uh, the same word it means to be bowed down in grief. The loss of Isaac's mother Sarah weighed heavily on him because the mistress of the house plays an important part in the home and the spiritual presence that she manifests in it. That's why Sarah's tent flaps were always open. She was hospitable. Her lamp was always burning. And and Isaac loved his mother. But when she died, he felt the loss of his mother's presence. And in Genesis 24, 65, it says, And she, and when Eliezer is coming back with Rebekah, who is the bride who is coming to the bridegroom, said to the servant, to Eliezer, Who is this man that walks in the field to meet us? And the servant says, It is my Lord. The messianic pictures here are, are, are incredible. And she took the veil and she covered herself. And uh, it says in 67, it says, Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac is comforted after the death of his mother. It doesn't say that he courted her first. It says he married her, and he loved her. And from here, we see God's picture of redemption and how the messianic line is continued through the promised seed. And I had mentioned earlier when I was talking about the promise that was made to David, which is connected in this half Torah portion is connected to this, which we'll get to after the break. So let's all stand. Heavenly Father, Father, we were in amazement at your Torah that, uh, that Lord, we we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't be... uh, we wouldn't even know who you were, Father, if, if uh, these patriarchs didn't adhere to your word, if they hadn't believed your promises, if uh, they didn't follow through and, and as to what you had spoken to them. We thank you, Father, for their faith, for their believing. And Father, how many times you do things in our lives regardless of what we do. But Father, by your determinate counsel, you see us through in our lives. So together... Blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have granted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Let's take a break. Well, while people are still coming in, if you guys would, let's... uh... Let's get ready to pray. If you'll join me, please. Let's pray. Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Father in heaven, just thank you again for your Shabbat, that we can take a day where we're not just allowed, but even commanded to rest and just rest in you. And Father, we come here not just to play church or to learn a little tidbit or whatever, but we want to come and give back to you. You've given so much to us, those of us that have found Yeshua and that believe in the work that he did to save us and to bring us to you, God. And then after all that, you reveal your Torah through him. That So many of us had no idea what Torah was. We didn't even know the foundation, and yet you allowed us to find your son and to hang on to him and to know that we could be grafted in to be a child of the living God. And you, our Lord, you're the one we come to worship today. As the angels and all in heaven say continually, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who was and is and is to come. We come here today to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Help us, Father, just to Fill this place. I pray you would just let your spirit descend and fill this place as we all turn and look towards you. We give glory to your son, Yeshua, Father. And we know he in turn, 
He's worthy of all the suffering, all the pain and ridicule that he went through, Father. But he earned every bit of the glory and praise and honor that you want him to receive. And that's why we're here, to give that all to him, because we know he absolutely turns and gives it all to you, Father. And that's what he ever lives for, is to give glory to you. Help us to focus on that. And I just pray, Father, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. We love you and praise you in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. together as a great congregation we just thank you for it is you who have made us not we ourselves we are your people and the sheep of your pastors whom you have redeemed by the blood of Yeshua we worship you we praise you we magnify your great name in the name of Yeshua for you are the great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, our Redeemer. We thank you that there is no other name that are given in the heaven whereby men must be saved, have their salvation in any other, but in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. We thank you, Father, for your servant, our pastor, and his wife, Lord, Vicky. We thank you for our sister and pastor and for all the elders for Sue and all the leaders of El Shaddai, whom you have chosen. Oh, Father, you have chosen them. You have ordained them. You have anointed them for this hour and for this time to bring forth your words and to teach us as your disciples, to admonish us how to walk and how to live in this world. We just magnify your great name today, Father. We just thank you that you is a great balm in Gilead. You are the great physician. You knew all things before this day, Father. You knew us when you made Adam the first man. You knew that this day we would be here today. We just thank you, Father, that you gather us as a flock to be here today. Father, thou knowest all things. As you said, the very here of our heads are all numbered. Father, you knew us in our hearts and in our thoughts and in our minds. You know all things. There is nothing that I hid from thee, O Father. You know the end from the beginning, Lord. You know the numbers of our days, Father. Lord, you know the desire of our heart, where we hurt, where we pain, what we are standing in need of, Father. And today it is written in your Torah. You send your word and heal them. You said, Father, there was not one feeble person that you have brought out the children of Israel out of misery. So today, Father, we pray for your healing power, for your anointing to be upon your people today. Let the rain fall today. Let the rain fall upon your people today, Father. But this is the heart and this is the will of your servant, that you will do things your way. Not our way, not the way of man, O oh Lord, but you will do things your way, Father. Speak 
to the heart and to the spirit of your people today. Rise your spirit, O oh Father. Impart your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding in the heart of your people today. Prepare their heart, Lord, to do ministry. Prepare their heart, Lord, to go forward in the power of the Ruach HaKadosh today. Father, how can we forget Israel, a people whom you have chosen, the seed of Abraham, through whom you have brought forth your word today. Without the children of Israel, we would not have the Torah today. Without Moses, without Abraham, without Isaac, without Jacob, Father, without the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos and all the prophets, Father, through whom you have spoken your word, O oh Father, without them, we would not have your Torah today. Then, Father, how could we forget Yeshua, the Lamb of God, who have taken away the sins of the world? He is the one who has the authority and the power to forgive our sins. We thank you that when none was found worthy, for all have sinned, we have all fallen, O oh Father. As it is being said, we could not lift ourselves up. But you came down, Yeshua. You gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You did not come into the world to destroy the world, but you came to seek and to save that which is lost. We are the last sheep of the house of Israel, whom you have gathered today, Father. Bring restoration today. Bring victory today, Father. You said you will not withhold your peace. Hallelujah. You will not withhold your peace, Father, until you have made Jerusalem a praise in the earth. When the children of Israel was in Babylon, they sing this song. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? When we remember Zion, when we remember Jerusalem, our hearts, oh God, pain within us. Because we know that one day you will restore your people. You will bring them back in the land from the east, the west, the north, and the south. Today is the day, Father. Quicken their spirit today. Open your heart today. Open your mind today. Bring them back from the east, the west, the north, and the south. And restore them according to your promises, according to your covenant. Bring restoration to Israel today. Father, we pray for the prime ministers. We pray for all your people today. Oh, mighty Father, remember your word. Remember your promises. We know you cannot fail. We know that you are Yahweh, you cannot lie. We know your word is circling heaven today. Touch your people today. Heal today. Those that are in the hospitals, oh Father, afflicted with cancer, with tumor, with ulcer. Remember the doctors today. Remember the widows today. Remember the children today. David, your servant said, you said that David was a man after your own heart. David said, I was young and became old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, not their seed begging for bread. Feed your people, Father. Feed them. Not only with the bread of life, but with the natural bread. Open doors, Father, because you said you open and no man shut, and you shut and no man open. Open the doors to your people today, Father. Oh, bless your people today. Cover under your blood today. Let your anointing fall in this place today. Let the Holy Spirit, the power of your Ruach Kaddish, today be upon every heart, Father. For we thank you. Because you are faithful to your promises. And you will do it. Because we believe that you are the one. You are the Holy God. The only God. The I am that I am. The Alpha, the Amigo. The beginning and the end. We praise you and we worship you today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. How many guests do we, that new people that we have with us here this morning that uh, have come to visit us? We, we have a couple, couple here from New Mexico. Right. Anyone else? Over here? Arkansas. It's one of our favorite states. <laughs> Anyone else? Where are you from? Michigan. Michigan. Very good. Well, we're glad to have you. I think that's about it. Glad to have you guests. We must have had most of our guests last week. There's one more. East Wenatchee. East Wenatchee. Had a little bit of snow over there, I guess, or somewhat snow.
Well, good. Well, welcome. Afterwards, uh, after the service, and of course, uh, in accordance with the prayer that, uh, that Leslie had, we have great respect for the sanctuary that we're in. And uh, when I uh, am in the closing prayer, we'd like to keep uh, it as quiet in the sanctuary as possible. Those of you that want to come to the altar to, uh, to pray or to be prayed for by our uh, elders, you're certainly welcome to do that. But uh, we love fellowship. Of course, Onig's next week. But uh, if you want to fellowship and talk with your neighbors, if you could go out into the lobby so that those can uh, pray here in the lobby. So, so are you set? Okay, well, it's, there's a song said, Are You Ready? And because uh, this one's a long one, so uh, put on your seatbelt. But this is, this is going to be an exciting part of the half Torah portion. And it starts in 1 Kings, and this is the half Torah portion, which is in the prophets, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, Now King David was old and stricken in years. If we look at Genesis 24.1, which is the Torah portion, it says Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now, these words here, stricken in years and stricken in age, age and years are the same word in the Hebrew. It means their days, they were, uh, their days were passing, their strength had been, had been given out. But what it says here about Abraham, it says that he, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And after the death of Sarah, he had secured a wife uh, for Isaac, but Abraham then took another wife after Sarah had passed. Genesis 25, 1, it says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And uh, he must have had a little bit of energy to get on to decide to, uh, to take on another wife. Um, I know some of you are smiling there now. Just... <laughs> And she bare him Zimran and uh, Jokshan and uh, Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Ashua. And uh, this name, of course, there's six sons, and the familiar one to you was probably Midian, who turned out to be the this, this descendants were the Midianites who, uh, who had attacked Israel uh, on several points during their time in the wilderness. But look at 25, verse 5. It says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, okay? Uh, but it goes a little bit further than that. It says, unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts, and he sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So here was, a, here was the promised seed. Abraham gave Isaac... Abraham had other sons, I'll read a little bit, of, and his descendants, Ishmael, but it says that he gave gifts to the sons of, uh, the children of, the sons of his concubines, and he sent them away from Isaac. Just like he didn't want Isaac to go out of the land, he, he, he sent the sons, the concub, sons of the concubines away from Isaac. And there was another promised seed that had also been given everything. In John chapter 3, verse 35, Yeshua said, The Father loves the Son and hath given all things into His hand. While the sons of the concubines were significant in God's plans, yet they were not in the same category or caliber as Isaac was. Now, a concubine has no marriage settlement. A concubine is a way to, to promote the, uh, prom promulgate the seed but there was no marriage settlement that was involved. So besides the sons of Keturah, which there was six, in 25.12 it says, Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And these are the names of the son of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth and Kedar, and Adbeel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Akedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their nations. Some of you may have seen this uh, chart before, if you could bring this up for me. But uh, up in this area, up here, it's, it's Abraham, and then it, uh, it shows the... Uh, uh, Isaac's seed here, 
and Jacob and the 12 sons of Israel, and it shows the Midianites. And I know you can't see this, but we'll have a printout for this. But you can see the descendants of Abraham. Abraham's uh, posterity, you can see Keturah's line here, six sons. You can see the Midianites, of which come the Arabs. You can see uh, Sarah, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. The Edomites came from Esau's line, the Israelites from Jacob and Israel, Arabs, Jews, and the ten tribes. Hagar's line, Ishmael, 12 sons, 12 tribes. These are all, all Arabs, and of course the same thing from Lot's line. So you look at all of these descendants here, there's just one of them that are the Jews. These families populated the Arab world But yet Abraham sent away Keturah's children to avoid conflict while fulfilling God's commission. You look at this here in the the, uh, Middle East, this area here, of course Israel is up in this area up here, but this area here is the territory of the Ishmaelites and the Amalekites. This is where Amalek attacked Moses in this area, in the area of Mount Sinai. So they had quite a bit of territory that they inhabited, but it was made very clear that Abraham sent them away from Isaac. Okay, we talk about sanctification. Now, God had made a promise to David as well. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, it says it came to pass, and now this is, we're leading up to the half Torah portion, it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest all about from his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And the, of course the temple had not been built yet, but David did bring the ark back to Jerusalem, and it, it was within a tent, but yet David dwelt in a house of cedar. But he became preoccupied with building a house for God, made with hands. And God's thought was how to build David's house through his spiritual seed, the Messiah. David's thoughts were about himself and where he sat. He didn't rise above who I am. But when when he sent, when he went in, when Nathan came to him and he sat before the Lord, he said, who am I? What's, what is my house? And so here it is, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 4. It says, it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, the prophet, saying, go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, shall you build me a house to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but I've walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spoke I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? God never asked for a house to dwell in. He said, Did I ever say he made it clear he didn't need anybody to build him a house? But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10, it says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and, ha- and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make you a house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish who? His kingdom. Talking about David's what? His seed. It's amazing how God can take these situations And he can take a situation like Abraham getting ready to sacrifice Isaac and bring out of it the promised seed. Well, we're going to go into this half Torah portion, which is definitely a story and an account of drama. How many of you like drama? Well, this one is certainly drama. David was a king. If you bring that up for me. 
And I don't know if a king necessarily looks like that, but that would be Nathan as prophet, but David's the king. Some of you guys look like this guy up here. 713, it says, He shall build a house for my name, talking about the seed after David, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, David being a king, a king has what? A kingdom. Abraham, now listen to this, Abraham secured the land through the promise, but the Lord would secure the kingdom for his seed, for David's seed, the kingly Messiah. 2 Samuel 7, 17, in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan, after he had the vision, he came to David and he spoke to David. He said, and then King David went in and he sat. He told him all the words of what the Lord had appeared to him, and then King David went. And he sat before the Lord, and instead of saying, you know, I am, I'm the one that should be building this house, he says, who am I? Who am I? O Lord God, and what is my house that you brought me this far? And when David realized that the promise was through faith, he was overwhelmed by the grace. He didn't do anything to merit it. He said, who am I? Many times, many of you feel that way. If you don't think I feel that way, or Pastor Mark is, what are we doing here? What in the world, how in the world did we bring Lamore Live Not from the Knesset here? How do we rate having some of these individuals? How do we rate going to Israel and making connections with a country of, that is the subject of worldly affairs through the centuries. And David was overwhelmed. Now, in the later years of his life, his seed that was promised would be challenged. The king's seed would be challenged by the foes of his own household. And we go back to the beginning of the Torah portion. It says, now King David in 1 Kings 1 was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm, which means his life was passing for, from him. And we go into the drama, to the account of this drama, which is the account of Adonijah and Absalom. Uh, and anticipating his father's death, Davis David's oldest living son sets the stage for himself to become king. David had approximately 15 sons, but there was one rightful heir to the throne, and that was Solomon. It's not on your notes, but in 2 Samuel 12, 25, it says he, uh, David sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. So Solomon was also known by that name. Now, David had some other sons who weren't so ethical. And this begins what's known as the tale of the three princes or the tale of the three kings, would-be kings, and it is drama. But we see it unfold every day around the world and even in our own lives and churches and in businesses. So follow this drama. All of these sons that David had weren't all from the same woman. That's why the king had the privilege of having concubines and many wives so that his seed would continue on. And one of his sons, whose name was Amnon, had a sister who was Tamar, and he, and he had an eye for, for, for Tamar, T-A-M-A-R. And there was another son whose, whose name was Absalom, who was very close to Tamar as well. Well, to make a long story short, Amnon who's fond of her, and there's an account you can read about it, he ends up raping her. And David did nothing about it to bring Amnon to justice, except for being upset about it. And when he found out about it in 2 Samuel, and this is not on your notes, but in 2 Samuel 13, 21, it says, but when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth, he was very angry, but he didn't do anything about it. And so David's other son, Absalom, was angry because he was also close to Tamar. And so he plotted to have his brother Amnon killed. And so he conspired with uh, actually some of the sons of the king as well as other individuals. And uh, he gave the word, and Amnon was killed. And David found out about that. He was very upset. He was comforted that Amnon was dead and that he was brought to justice, 
but he banished Absalom from the kingdom. And at Joab's, which was uh, David's general, and his request, and you, there's a whole account that's involved with this, uh, Absalom was at one point allowed to return to Jerusalem, but he was not allowed to see David. So as concerning Absalom, in 2 Samuel 14, 24, the king said, let him turn, talking about Absalom, to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, and he saw not the king's face. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. But the blemishes were there. Absalom was lifted up with pride, and we'll see that as we get into this account. Absalom becomes an easy because he can't see the king, because he was banished for a period of time. He was not allowed. He was still in the family, but he was not allowed into the king's household to see David. And so David finally lifts the ban. He's allowed to see, and David, it says, if you read the account, David kissed his neck. He loved Absalom. He was his son, but he was displeased with what he'd done. So Absalom decides to go on a course of his own, and in 2 Samuel 15, 1, it says it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. He starts assembling his own group, his own bodyguards. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment... Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there's no man deputed of the king to hear thee. So just to give you what the picture is, Absalom, he's allowed to come back and see his father, but then he decides to start building his own, he starts doing his own thing. He puts together bodyguards, he puts together another little army, And then he assembles at the gate. Now, you remember, David was king in Hebron for seven years and 33 years in Judah. And so Absalom puts together his own little group, and he assembles at the gate. And as people come by to get judgment from the king, he says, hey, what are you you coming here for? What, what What is it that? He says, you don't need to go to the king. I can hear this for you. And Absalom said in verse 4, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge. If I, if I was just judge in the land, that every man which has any suit or cause might come unto me, and I will do him justice. So what's he inferring? That maybe David wasn't exactly doing justice for his people. So it began to make David look lowly in the eyes of the people, and that Absalom was great. And he had all of the ingredients because he was good-looking. He was strong, but he was lifted up with pride. But this is what he did as a judge in the gate. People would come, and do you think to gain favor with the people, what kind of, what, how, how do you think, what would he do with his decisions in the matters that came to him? It would most likely flow in the people's direction because he wanted to gain favor with these people. And it was so, and it says it in verse 5 that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. What a great guy. He was everybody's pal. He He was putting together his own group because he was beginning to think he would be the king. In fact, in verse 6 it says, On this manner did Absalom to all Israel. It came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He made alliances with enough people and it became so popular that he felt he could take the kingdom. So he makes an attempt to usurp the kingdom and he's lifted up with pride because of his his merit, because of his quality, because of his beauty. And he even raised up an army and came against David and David had to take his household and flee from Jerusalem. And he was brought as far as the Jordan, and it it divided David's household. It divided the priesthood because Abiathar, who was one of the priests, 
and Zadok was the other priest. Zadok was faithful to David. Biathar went with Absalom and set up a priesthood with Absalom crowning himself as king, being the big deal because he wasn't happy with his father. He wanted to be the big deal. What ends up happening is Absalom ends up getting killed by Joab, who's, who is David's general, in the rebellion. And this is why, I had to give you this background on it, this is why in 1 Kings, Absalom is mentioned in this half Torah portion, because his brother Adonijah, who is the real subject, follows in his footsteps, this time to usurp the rightful heir to the throne. And so we pick it up here in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5. Like brother, like brother, then Adonijah. Now, this 1 Kings 5, remember, this is where David is now on his deathbed. He's losing warmth. Abishag was a maid that was put in to keep him warm. It says David did not know Abishag. Okay? She was probably part of the concubine, but, she, but he did not know her in an in in intimate way. But, at, but after the death of Absalom, and, and this really teed Joab, Je, uh, David's general off, because Joab ended up killing Absalom when he was hanging in a tree. And when David found out, he says, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. And Joab came in and he thought, What are you talking about? He just tried to take your kingdom. And David was too lenient in terms of understanding where his seed would go. And Joab, it, it teed Joab off and to where Joab became a part of this second rebellion years later. And in verse 5 it says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, who was his mother, exalted himself. He says, I will be king. Why did he say that? Because David was getting ready to die. Logically, he was the next in line to be king, only he wasn't going to wait around for anybody to tell him that, that he could be king. He was going to go ahead and do it, so he did the same thing. He prepared himself, chariots and horsemen, and 50 men to run before him. And look at, in 1.6 here, it says, He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. But David's relationship with Adonijah was somewhat liberal. Got to remember, he had 15 sons. Kings seemed to be very busy. I have enough with five kids and a wife and a cat. You can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine what a king has. But his relationship with Adonijah was somewhat liberal. In 1 6, it says, And his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, Why have you done this? He never confronted Adonijah and he never corrected him. So Adonijah felt that he could do anything that he wanted to do because he was enabled by David to do that by David never correcting him. Well, this comes in play with another Torah portion regarding, regarding uh, Jacob and Esau relative to the promised seed, which is in the next Torah portion next week. Now, David made many mistakes in his career, and they were now returning to haunt him. But it was crucial now as it affected the promised seed of the king, which is why you are all sitting here today. Well, it says here in 1 Kings 1 7, it's Adonijah's fellow conspirators. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. And in verse 9, it says, Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zohaleth, which is by Enrogel, which, where there was water, uh, which, where the king could be anointed. He also invited, now listen to this, he also invited all his brothers, the king's sons and the men of Judah, the king's servants, all the people that he'd been influencing all along. All the people that he, he had formed alliances with as well, just like Absalom had done, because he was going to be the king, because now he was the big cheese. Dad was passing away. But there's just a slight problem with what he did, because in verse 10 it says he didn't invite Nathan the prophet. Benaniah, the mighty man, which was one of David's mighty men, or Solomon, his brother, the promised seed of the kingly line was to go to who? 
Solomon. So he just overlooked a slight little detail. He brought all the people together that were in favor with him, except the one that really mattered, who was going to be the next king of Israel. And that's where Adonijah's head was at. And possibly and most likely he didn't invite them because because he was planning to kill Solomon. He had meetings to gain favor just as Absalom did to further his ambitions. Nathan the prophet became privy to this plot and he goes to Bathsheba. Now this isn't on your notes, but but, uh, Nathan goes to Bathsheba and this is in 1 Kings 1.11. If you have your Bibles, you can look at this or just listen. You can read it later. Nathan came to Bathsheba, who was the mother of Solomon, and he said, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Verse 13, go immediately to King David and say, Did you not, my Lord, O king, swear to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, your son Solomon shall reign after me, and he shall sit on the throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? And in verse 16 it says, And Bathsheba came to the king and bowed and did homage. And the king said, What is your wish? And she said, My Lord, you swore by the Lord your God to your maidservant, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on the throne. So now look, Adonijah has become king, and now, my Lord the king, you don't know about it. And in verse 20, And as for you, my king, my Lord, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of the Lord my king after him. David had lost it someplace. He didn't rebuke, he didn't reprove his son. And so Adonijah took the opportunity to crown himself as king because David in one part of his life was irresponsible. And so now it affected all of Israel and all of you because the promised seed of the Messiah was dependent upon that seed just like it was with Isaac. Well, Nathan now approaches David. He comes in, in verse 24 of chapter 1, and Nathan said, My Lord, O king, have you said that Adonijah shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? And in verse 28 it says, King David answered and said, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And in verse 29, and this should be on your notes, the king took an oath. He took an oath and said, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, so I certainly will do this day. And in verse 33, the king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the shofar and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him. He shall come and sit on my throne, and he shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Adonijah's really got a problem now. Absalom's rebellion came because he was bitter towards his father for rejecting him and because he was lifted up with pride, motive and ambition. And because of his own opinion of himself being self-appointed and so his rebellion turned out to be a bloody rebellion. But Adonijah's rebellion was not a bloody rebellion. His came about because of disobedience. His father never corrected him. And he felt his father would not oppose him if he took the throne because logically he was in line because he was the oldest. He just did it without inviting Nathan the prophet and his brother Solomon who was lined up for the throne. So it says in chapter 1, verse 39, Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the shofar, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. Now how the account goes from here is that Adonijah was spared because when he found out and he heard the blowing of the shofars throughout the land because the new king had been appointed, he said, "Uh uh-oh. 
right? And what he did was is he ran to the altar and he grasped the horns for mercy to protect his life. And he asked Solomon through an intermediary to spare his life and to take an oath that he would not kill him. And Solomon did so. But his heart did not change. Sometimes we think people will change in their motives and ambitions, but because of, uh, of their own self-interest, it continues on and on. What he did was, is he came to Bathsheba. Now, this is written in, in 1 Kings. You can read this in chapter 2, but follow me without having to look at it because it's not in your notes. Adonijah comes to Bathsheba, David's wife, one of his most favorite wives, and he asks to have Abishag, who was David's concubine, in, in marriage. He asks for Abishag not because he loves her, but it, that it might reclaim or it might renew his chance to claim the throne because having a concubine of the king was looked upon as a victory to have the wife of his predecessor. Absalom tried to do the same thing, and he did do the same thing. When David left Jerusalem in the rebellion, it says that Absalom laid with David's concubine in the sight of all Israel to show that he had taken control over the throne. Now, Adonijah comes back through Bathsheba and tries to get one of David's concubines, Abishag. And listen to how, and this isn't in your notes, but it's in the Word. Just listen to this. This is how he approaches Bathsheba. Listen to these words. He said, you know, the kingdom was mine. That's what he said to me. You know, the kingdom was mine. So he thought he still deserved it. Then he says, and all Israel set their expectations on me that I should reign, you know, because I because I'm so great, and I'm the king's son. So he thought he had the people's favor. But then he says, however, the kingdom's been turned over. Oh, it's become my brother's, but, then he finally admits, but it was from the Lord. Oh, why didn't you just say that first? <laughs> he said it last. And what happens is, is when Solomon gets word, Adonijah then loses his life because he tries, he, in his heart, he still tries to usurp the throne. You know, it says in Proverbs 30, 33, the churning of milk brings butter, but the ringing of the nose brings forth blood, so the forcing of wrath brings forth strife. His words may have been smoother than butter, but he had war in his heart. How many people do you know like that? And so what was the outcome how does this relate to the Torah portion? Well, in Matthew 1, 6, it says, Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah, and then Solomon begat Rehoboam, of which you know that the tribes then split. But still, in spite of this great calamity and these conspiracies and these rebellions, the promised seed of the king still continued. And that's why you're sitting here today because there was another king that was born who was also the promised seed. And so in Genesis 25, 7, which is the Torah portion, it says, these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived. And the musicians can come forward. So I'm going to close here. A hundred, three score, and 15 years. So Abraham lived a good life. He didn't need to have an Abishag in his bed. He lived 38 years past Sarah's death and long enough to see Jacob and Esau, which is in the next Torah portion, live to the age of 15. But he did not live to see the conflict that would be between them, where Esau would try to gain ascendancy to the birthright, but Jacob would steal it from him. So you see, God works in our lives regardless what we do at times to bring forth his determinate counsel. Isaac would feel the weight of the covenant call, but with Sarah gone, his faith would be renewed by the comfort of Rebekah, the wife that was selected by the father. Genesis 25, 8, it says, Abraham gave up the ghost and died in good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. 
Now follow this, which is a prophetic part of this statement in this Torah portion. It says, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. This is almost prophetic that Ishmael and Isaac apparently had, were able to reconcile long enough in their quest for who was the son of the promise. For there was also promises made to Ishmael, but not the same promise for the, for the kingdom as it was for Isaac. Yet they came together long enough to bury the patriarch. And so perhaps one day, Jew and Arab with a common father and origin will be in a united future. And that's up to the Father. So why don't we all stand? Gracious God and King, Father, you are the God of destiny. Father, you know the end from the beginning. There is nothing that can get by you, Father. You know every circumstance and situation that comes across us in our lives and, of course, in the lives of the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings. But, Father, you saw to it that that promised seed would continue and sustain until it brought forth our Redeemer, the King of kings and the Lord of all lords, Yeshua, our Mashiach. Amen. David wanted to bless God, but God wanted to bless him, just like he wants to bless us, to come to bow before us and uh, to lift up his countenance, as Danny Ben-Gigi said last week, is holding up a child and gazing with his countenance, lifting his countenance upon him. That's what the Lord wants to do with us, and that's what he told Moses to tell Aaron how to bless his people. And he said, May Yahweh bless you and keep you, May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. Go in peace and be blessed. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Our pastor will be back Monday night. Praise God. Have a great Shabbat.